video 13, uh, Mechanisms of Evolution. We've been talking about a little bit about Charles Darwin, so let's talk about how evolution actually takes place. When you think about evolution, evolution means that it's a gradual change in organism over time. Now, you have to know some terms, and I have the terms down here. Gene pool is the first one. A gene pool is all the alleles in a population. So if we look at the classroom, for example, uh, it would be how many people have blue eyes, how many people have brown eyes, how many people have uh, black hair, how many people have blonde hair, how many people are Caucasian, how many people are African American. That would be our gene pool. Now, as long as the gene pool stays the same, nothing ever is going to change. So, in order for evolution to occur, there has to be a change in the gene pool. I hope that I hope that makes sense to you. Now, we could even take that gene pool and we could look at the allelic frequency. We could find out the exact percentage of um, dominant brown eyes or recessive blue eyes. We could actually find out the actual percentage, and that would be allelic frequency. So the higher the allelic frequency, the more often you'll see it. The lower the allelic frequency, the less often you'll see it. Uh, genetic equilibrium, as long as the population stays the same, then genetic equilibrium is reached. I mean, there's no change. So you have to change genetic equilibrium. It has to be broken in order for evolution to occur. So and that's what I put down here. Evolution does not occur unless genetic equilibrium changes. So I hope you understand that the gene pool, the allele frequency has got to change for evolution to even take place. Now, ways genetic equilibrium can change. How can it be broken? There's actually four ways that we're going to talk about that you have to remember for the test. And the first one is genetic drift. Genetic drift is just by chance. It's going to happen in very small populations. You know, what I can think of is like a mud puddle. A mud puddle might have microorganisms living in it, tadpoles, whatever. And you come along with your four-wheeler and run through the mud puddle and splash out water. Uh, it's going to kill some of those organisms. It's just going to be a chance event. It's not going to necessarily happen yearly or daily or anything like that. It's just going to be a chance event causing it to happen. Um, a genetic drift is only going to affect a small population, though. Think about something comes through and wipes out Billville. That's really not going to affect the world's gene pool. It's just, but now it does affect Billville's gene pool, but it won't affect the world's gene pool. So genetic drift is only going to work in small populations. The second way genetic drift can change is by mutation. And mutations we know happen constantly. Point mutations, frame mutations, chromosome mutations. Um, so if a mutation occurs which makes an organism better able to survive, then it's going to cause genetic equilibrium to change because that organism is going to survive, mate, reproduce, and that gene, that allelic frequency of that mutated gene is going to increase and cause genetic equilibrium to change. Natural selection is, you know, Charles Darwin's baby right here. This is when nature selects for what survives and what moves on, and certain alleles die out, and certain alleles become more prominent. Um, there's actually three types of natural selections, and I'm going to draw a little diagram for you if if we looked at a common bell-shaped curve all right a bell-shaped curve would look like this maybe had like small organisms on the left and medium organisms in the middle and and large organisms on the right stabilized selections whenever the medium would be selected so we would have more of them so the chart would actually end up looking like this more of them selected than another I'll give you an example let's say we had a type of animal that lived on the beach if they're really really tiny they got eaten by everything, so there wasn't very many of them. If they're really, really large, they were so slow that they got eaten by everything, too. The medium ones, though, were big enough to not get eaten by everything, and they were small enough they could run away from most things. So you have more of the medium survive in the, in the environment. Directional selection is when one extreme or the other is favored. So that bell-shaped curve is going to be on one end or the other. So go back to the same example. The real small ones are getting eaten. Real, even the medium ones might be getting eaten now, and the large ones are so big that nothing messes with them. So there's more large in the population than anything else. That's directional, one end or the other. Now disruptive will look like an eon. This is when the small ones are all small enough they can hide. The large ones are so big and bad, nothing messes with them. And the medium ones, too, too big to hide, uh, not big enough to scare things away. So they get eaten. That's disruptive. So the one in the middle gets wiped out. Uh, the last thing is immigration and immigration. And, and I think of like this, you know, the, the one with the I, I, immigration means into, and the one with E, immigration means to exit. So if 
you had people or organisms coming into a population, that's going to increase the gene pool a little frequency. That could cause evolution. If you have people leaving a population or organisms leaving a population, that could shrink the gene pool. That could also cause a genetic equilibrium change and cause evolution. All right. Now, if you have evolution occur, you might even have a new species occur. There's a great picture um, in a book I have in classroom of squirrels that all lived together and, and mated and, and, and together and everything and had one species. And then the Grand Canyon came along, and as the, as the river started to eat away at the Grand Canyon, these squirrels uh, became less and less likely to mate with one another. And you actually had two species of squirrel created. You have one on one side of the mountain that has like, on one side of the, the uh, Grand Canyon that has like dark fur, and one on the other side that has light fur. Uh, they have a common ancestor. They both have the same great, great, great granddaddy, but they are different because now they can't inter intermate. And that would be an example of geographic isolation, which is the first way it can be caused. Uh, geographic isolation would be like a mountain range preventing species from mating or a river or being on an island. You couldn't mate with the people, uh, organisms on the mainland, you know, something like that. Reproductive isolation, we see this all around us. Uh, there's different ways. Um, they might be sterile for one, for one way. What I mean by that, well, no, I shouldn't say sterile. Um, the organism's sperm might be unable to penetrate the egg of another of that org of another organism, um, or they might have different reproductive structures. Think about flowers, for example. Some flowers are shaped to be pollinized by bees, and some are pollinated by hummingbirds. Let's say they have different structures, so diff reproductive isolation be one. And then chromosome number. This is usually caused by a mutation, and you know trisomy trisomy is the main one there, especially the Down syndrome we think about. All right, um, two ways evolution can occur is gradually and punctuated. Now, gradually is just what it says. It's going to happen very slowly over time. I mean, this is what Darwin uh, envisioned, that it slowly happened. Punctuated equilibrium be all at once. This would be some type of catastrophic event. If you think about humans, humans basically have been unchanged for the last 200,000 years. So if we ever do evolve, um, it wouldn't be gradually. It's going to be punctuated. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a nuclear holocaust. Um, you know, storms are going to hit the earth. Global warming is finally going to take over. Something's going to happen, uh, and make the gene pool shrink, and then a new species comes from there. All right. The last thing is types of evolution, and you definitely need to know these. And, and I've got a picture. I've got some pictures in my book at school that I want to show you uh, tomorrow. But divergent evolution is when you have a common ancestor. Let's think about Darwin's finches, for example. They all came from one bird, but because they lived on different islands and they only mated with those birds on those islands and they had different environments, they started to look totally different. So they all come to the same grand ancestor, but they all look different because of the environment they're in. So they're all related, but look different. Now, convergent evolution would be um, different, a lot of different species that have no relation whatsoever start to look similar because they live in the same environment. I like to think about, if I asked you to give me an example of or describe animals in a desert, what color are they? You would say brown because even though they're different species, they're brown because that's an advantage to be brown in the desert. If I would tell you to give me what color animals were in Alaska, you'd probably say white. I mean, so that's an example of convergent evolution. Divergent, they're related, and they diverge, they separate. Convergent, they're all different, but they all look similar because they live in the same environment. All right, guys, that's video 16. I hope that helps you, and I want you to have a nice day.